Cool. So I, I feel like this this talk is like trying to meld different facets of the work that I do. So like and that and three people who are each very dear to me are, have been helping me to do this with Peja thinking about agile science, Dana helping me to understand patient led innovation, and then Daniel working on control systems in Karen. And so I'm I've got the fun task of trying to see if I can figure out to t how do I weave all those things together. Uh, and I personally think they're connected, and I hope you do by the end of this. And then I very much see my job as teeing up uh, 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 Dana and Daniel. So just to give a sense of where I'm going, uh, this, this talk is going to be very much, particularly at the Agile Sciences, I'm mostly going to be focusing on why. And so if you think about sort of how, what layer of zooming I'm at, we're like at the, you ever seen that old show of like the powers of 10, right? Where you zoom into the cell and then you zoom out to the, to astronomy, right? We're, we're kind of living in astronomy right now. Uh, intentionally to kind of ask, to start to challenge some questions on why we do what we do to sort of think, is there ways that we can do things better, more efficiently, uh, and even more ethically and equitably? Um, so I'm going to start with this very level, high level view on, on guiding principles. And then I want to discuss the concept of small data and why we need a small data paradigm. And then I'm basically going to tee up uh, Daniel and Dana's talks. Um, and I probably should have reversed those based on the order, but anyway. Uh, so first, just to give a basic sense on motivation, uh, you know, I've given lots of different talks on agile science, but the long and the short of it is the cost benefit of our health sciences isn't very good. We spend a lot of money, we, do, we put a lot of resources, both in terms of healthcare, but I would also argue in terms of our health sciences, and we're getting increasingly diminished returns. Um, that's in terms of time, that's in terms of money. I think that would also be, uh, even in terms of we do work that often ends up on the, the shelf, right? The proverbial shelf, whether that be a digital health tool that doesn't get actually picked up and implemented or otherwise, right? And so one of the questions might be, how is it that our science is set up and what might be going wrong with our science that's, that we might be able to adjust and make improvements on to actually do better? And in particular, Digital technologies, you know, what the focus of this training is on, I would argue has created very different uh, conditions on how we can do science that allows us to be far more efficient and uh, how we do it to basically fix this cost benefit problem. Okay, and so in particular, I tend to love triangulation. Um, I, I can't tell you how often I make little diagrams like this to help me think. And so one of the things I was thinking about is like, okay, well, just how do we do science? You know, like, what, what is it involved, right? And so in some sense, one way you can frame it is we, we're trying to balance the past, the present, and the future, right? We, we have all of the evidence that we've gathered in the past using different methods and processes, right? We then have a variety of different research methods and processes, new ones that we're developing any time to sort of work through and, and move us into the future. But then, in particular, and this is the one that I think that sometimes we forget, uh, and, I'm, and this is the one I'm going to emphasize is, we also need these guiding principles. Uh, there's a book from the 1950s uh, by an author named Michael Polanyi called Personal Knowledge. Um, and the, the book there, it basically is arguing uh, about the importance of understanding that, that scientists are people, that they're humans, and that it's okay to actually be human. And in particular, a key thing that a human does that a computer and data evidence don't do is they can have an intuitive sense of what is possible. Or, put it more simply, they can imagine. And so, an important question is, is, well, what are we imagining? And how do we define those sort of guiding principles? Just like the preamble of the Constitution saying that we want to try to, in order to form a more perfect union, right? That's a wonderful aspiration we can always go for. But then, the question is, what are we aspiring to as scientists, okay? So, I'm starting there. What are these big aspirations? And so this is something Fetch and I have been spending a lot of time trying to think through, and that I'm going to connect it to the small data logic, right? So for us, when we think about agile science, there's some very clear goals. There's practical goals, scientific goals, and this is, will seem strange, but uh, documentation goals. And I'll come back to why that's so important uh, in a moment, right? But let me just hit on some uh, how we are thinking about these in terms of these goals, right? For us, the practical goal is just uh, we, we're dividing this in terms of the individual projects. You know, so what, what is the goal of a single project? That's the top one for any one of these. And then the bottom one is what is the goal when it comes to the enterprise of science? 
Okay, and so, and I think this is really important to separate, and I'll come back to why, particularly when it comes to small data. But our, practically, our first goal is to help individuals, right? And then, through our science, we want to make positive societal impact. Sound good, everybody? So far, so good, right? So then, second, science is different than that, right? In science, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to some sort of sense of, we've classically used the word generalization, although when I get to it later, I'll challenge if we should continue to use that phrase, but the, the concepts that we were, we've were we been really thinking about uh, for an individual study is usable evidence. And by usable evidence, what are we talking about? We're saying uh, we want the evidence to actually be useful for some future individual, right? There's a lot of times we can gather a lot of data and information, and then people looking back at it say, uh, what? <laughs> What do I do? How do I handle this, right? Like, it, and it doesn't necessarily align with the decision they're making, or it doesn't necessarily help them to understand the fundamental phenomenon of the, of the thing that they're trying to study, right? Uh, and so how do we make sure our, our evidence is actually usable for the people who want to use it? And then, so that's at an individual study project. And so like we've talked a lot about micro-randomization trials. So, that, you know, so it's like micro-randomization trials can give you very useful information if your goal is to build evidence to help people make better decisions. All the optimization trials very much fit into a usable evidence frame because it's like, do I include this component or not in a multi-component intervention? That's really usable evidence. Versus I run a randomized control trial and I throw a whole lot of things and then I have a whole lot of other things. And when I'm done, I'm like, Wait, what, what was the useful part? Like, what thing should I transfer to the next study? A lot of times you actually don't know, and so that's not necessarily very usable for the next person trying to build on your evidence base. Okay, so that's the usable evidence concept. Consilience. How many of you guys know the concept of, or heard the concept of consilience? That is, a, this is a very old scientific concept. And, and so in my mind, it's, it's sad that we've forgotten it, and so I'm just going to be very explicit about it. Have you, how many of you have heard the phrase triangulation or the concept of triangulation? That's, that's the basically, consilience is what triangulation is shooting for. It's basically coming down to the idea that every method has a strength and every method has a limitation. Because of that, you want to be able to balance those strengths and limitations of those different methods. And if those different methods start pointing in a common direction, you start to develop consilient knowledge, consilience. There's a great book, uh, an old book now, by E.O. Wilson called Consilience, uh, discussing the unification of knowledge. And in particular, it's very much a, a call for transdisciplinary research on how to do this. And so for us, a key concept is this, is actually striving not for a single definitive trial, right, a la a randomized control trial, but instead, consilience. Different methods pointing in a common direction, which actually starts to increase our confidence that what we're doing is actually true. Okay, last but not least in terms of a goal is documentation. On a single project, this might sound really simple, but change logs. How are you learning what you're learning? You know, and just making sure you've got some documentation of it. Why does that matter? Because we're increasingly realizing that the world is really complex. And from a, and this, and you can see how this actually ends up working up when you think about it at a, at a, at a like the enterprise of science. You wanna be basically mapping out the assumptions you're making. Because assumptions are usually the thing that bites us in the ass. And I'll come back to that in a little bit in terms of how we think about our process, right? So, so if those are our goals, that's what we're striving for. Then the, another way you can then balance this is sort of thinking, okay, that's our true north. That suggests success. Then the next question is, like, what is sort of our, our ethics, our values, our, our, our moral guideposts, so to speak? And so uh, there's three of them that we bring up from a scientific process, but also I just want to be explicit that we actually talked a lot about like basic ethics. So it's like ethics is key here, equity is key here, but we, uh, we were kind of thinking, we didn't necessarily put it explicitly here. But So the ones that we thought were particularly relevant for, for sort of an agile science perspective is one is resource efficiency. How do we learn more with less? And particularly you'll see from Dana's work, she, there's the, this little skateboard diagram that she'll get into that like it's very much in line with that sort of logic, but so is what Daniel and I have been doing on control systems uh, work. Um, and I would argue that's, that's also, by the way, a fundamental property of most. Linda Collins, that's, that's a core driver of most, is being resource efficient. So second one, and this is a little bit unique, is modularity. You know, basically saying, if the world is wicked complex, don't try to generalize everywhere, because you're probably not going to be right. And if anything, you might actually create more harm than good. 
Instead, be intellectually honest with yourself and say, I just built something that is useful here. And then slowly build out from that. And then, but know that it might actually be modulars and systems. And so this is very much the underlying logic of how the internet is built, right? We have all these different cool tools and resources that are built, and they're built in a way to work in an interconnected way, but they're also built in a way that they do their function well. So it's like Google Maps, right? They didn't build Google Maps so that you could get to a healthcare clinic, right? If they added that to get to an X, they just actually reduced its reusability, right? But if you have it where it's just like the goal is to help people get from X from A to B, well, now that actually is more generally useful. And so the goal of thinking about modularity is actually to think how do you build things in a modular fashion such that it does the thing it does well, knowing full well that you didn't solve the world with it. So it's sort of a, an interesting balancing act of humility, but also then thinking about the systems. And the last part is thinking about systems and systems. So something like taking on a public health lens, we talk about the social ecological model. But I would add, time really matters in these things, as we've been discussing with adaptive interventions and whatnot, right? So it's like, how do you start to get into a frame of mind that you know that your system is embedded in a system which is embedded in a system, right? So it's like, what are all those things that are happening within the skin and all of those systems that are going on, right? Your biological processes. Uh, and then you have the behavioral phenomenon and in the systems that happen there, like how you interact with other human beings, the social, socio-cultural structures that we have. And then you have all these things outside the sins. So you get to the, you get to culture, you get to, um, you know, relative and entrenched powers um, and a whole bunch of other interesting problems to get into. Understanding that all of those are actually dynamical systems that are co-interacting with each other. So it's like, how do you recognize that there is this huge world but then figure out how do you then work in a modular fashion to help advance some little small part of that. Okay, I know, I just zoomed out, right? I said I'm at astronomy level. How does this first sound just as like goals and aspirations? Does this seem okay to folks? Like something to tune to? Cool, all right. Moving forward then, what does this actually mean? Last step then is like, okay, so if that's our goals and our aspirations and our guiding principles, then what do we do? How do we do this? And again, I'm still staying at the astronomy level, but at a high level, we think about it as iterative triangulation. Where it is, or uh, my uh, Don Norman from Design Lab, he likes the phrase muddling through. And I think it's very similar concepts. Basically, starting with a lot of humility, knowing that we can't solve much, but then modeling our work very much like evolution, where you, small, you do these small incremental changes, constantly checking and articulating your assumptions. And so one way you can think about this is, sorry this is a little sketchy, but you can imagine that there's all these implicit assumptions that you don't know exist, right? And these things are, are built in to, the, to your logic. You don't even know they're happening. You know, they're hidden from you, right? And, they, and the goal partially is to try to figure out how do you get and sort of realize that they're there. You know, so it's like an assumption that is, I think, built into a lot of the current, you know, that cost-benefit ratio is that a randomized control trial is a definitive quote-unquote trial. Why? What is a random, why is, why would a randomized control trial be definitive? And for what? Just think about that for a moment because it's, it's really well-designed clinical trial, particularly for pharmaceuticals. Right? And the real reason why it has such power, I would argue, is because of the comparator. Because, it because of the placebo, it, that sets up a very nice study design that allows you to get both a very practical goal of asking, does this pill help relative to some meaningful comparator? And two, it gives you a very valuable scientific goal. Right? Because it actually allows you to isolate that pharmacokinetic mechanism. Okay? But what if that is not the question? What if that is not what you're controlling for? What if you're controlling for something far more complex? What if you actually are working in a very complex world? Well, then that might not be the strategy that you actually use to try to work through it, okay? So this, that's an, that's, so the, the idea of a definitive randomized control trial is an assumption. Uh, that that is the way that you, t you evaluate things, right? So one of the ways that we need to think about this is how do you start making and identifying the assumptions you're making, and then you come up with the most resource efficient way possible to test it. And so it's like, Pedro gave a fantastic example of this yesterday, right? It's like, if you wanna figure out how people are gonna react to a smart uh, speaker idea, don't build a smart speaker, put a phone in a box, and then talk to it. 
You know, it's like just get see what it feels like, right? That is a way to say, here's my assumption and here's my fast way of testing it, right? Or my group, the reason why I was having you guys just sort of the, the group three, they were the ones that asked questions. That was because they, I wanted them to be able to put forward some very basic assumptions and get fast feedback, right? And get it in a way where you could actually learn quickly from it. So there's a, there, there's a logic here versus I think often saying, I make an assumption then, and then you never actually test it and then you get bitten in the ass by assumptions, right? So at a process level, this is this iterative triangulation and you're constantly using different methods and processes to kind of vet your ideas, knowing that if you keep biasing towards one thing, say quantitative work, eventually the things that you don't learn because you never did the qualitative work is gonna start hurting you, okay? And so how do you actually get a build a process where you're doing this? Now, of course, probably you're saying, oh my God, that sounds so wickedly complex. What the hell? How, do, how would you actually pull this off? This seems so different from how we do clinical trials work. Right. So our aspiration is actually, going back to the idea of modules, is to build modularized processes. Knowing full well that not every method is appropriate for every research question and every problem domain. How do we take it and we build these small little modular elements and structures for handling, right? So our goal with these is build these concrete processes with specification of, of appropriate boundary conditions. This is that multi-dimensional generalization space. It's like, when is the thing, when is the right time to use a, a micro-randomization trial? When is the wrong time to use a micro-randomization trial? And this was very much a key point that Billy was getting at. It's like, what is your research question, right? And just be honest about that and don't get into a frame where one method can answer all those questions. And then how do you build a research process that actually handles that? And so even though this is highly nonlinear and iterative and adaptive, you can feasibly, through the logic of modularity, make small linear processes for individual projects. Okay, Get, does that make sense? Right, and so with it, the goal of modularity is to keep it simple, concrete, and usable for individual scientists. The individual scientists, they don't necessarily need to know how it fits into the broader enterprise. They just need to know, okay, this is the checklist that I can do. Which, by the way, then can fit into grants and study sections. So, like, oh, I know what success is. I know the process you're using. I can say you're using that well, right? And then, and this is, I think, the key part thinking beyond the individual project. We are a scientific enterprise. We learn through collective work. So, how do we actually build uh, the, the process such that we're actually optimizing for that? And that's the idea of how recognizing that it's modules as part of a bigger system. Okay, and so some new ways to think about some of that moving forward. I want to get to the small data stuff, but we've been thinking a lot about like how do you get like what is success? Who's leading it? What are the resources that are available? When is it not appropriate? Right. So it's like uh, when is it right for a researcher to lead a project versus when might it be right for a patient to lead a project? And what does that look like? And how do we honor that both of those are potentially valid ways of actually advancing health and science, the practical and the scientific? Okay, and so this is the example that I gave from last year. This is actually a drawing of Pedro's in my work uh, and how Donna comes in at the top there and Dave, this is basically Daniel in my work for these years. Like, I'm not gonna actually talk about this, but one of the modules that we've been working on is actually building out the adaptive interventions which very much grew out of most. And so if you wanna get more about this, watch the talk from this thing last year and you can get a sense of what it is. I wanna talk about small data. And so, in particular, I'm going to point you to a paper that we just published like a month ago. You can see Dana's one of our one of the key co-authors on this. It's basically arguing for a small data paradigm. Paradigm. And so, what do I mean by this, and why does this matter? So let's just start with three assumptions. So first of all, the high low point is how human health is wonderfully complex, right? So. Look at all these potential differences, right? I need 10 hours of sleep, five hours is good. I don't get any time to be active on weekends. I'm much more active on weekends. A busy day at work usually is an active day for me. My busy day means I'm sitting in front of a computer all day, right? Does that sound fairly feasible that we have all these individual differences, right? So that sets up the first assumption. People are different, cool? Okay, next one. This is actually from EMA work for like asking why weren't you being physically active? And so here's all these different contextual factors. I got sick, my kids had from the weather, it was not good, right? So what would be a summary from this? This is something Don already said, context matters, right? So people are different, context matters. Last one, this is an old classic one from Heraclitus. Everything changes and nothing stands still or how people have paraphrased it, change is the only constant. Right? So, what does that mean? Things change. People are different, context matters, 
things change. Seem like fair assumptions? If that's true, then we probably can't do everything with the classic way that we've been doing our science. And let me tell you why. Right? In essence, that's in a very complex problem space. And to get into really, the, the paper gets into quite a lot of detail in this. But the way we kind of re-architect that in terms of a wicked problem is the more dynamic it is, so the more that time matters, the more multivariate it is, think obesity, what are all the factors that actually influence someone's weight? And the more, this is a funky one, the more it manifests idiosyncratically. So it's like, think about weight control, right? We have a pretty good sense, actually, that energy balance is important, but it manifests idiosyncratically, right? Like one kid, a strawberry is a reinforcer. For another kid, a strawberry is punishment, right? And you can just see that across all the different phenomena that's going on, right? So if, if you then start using a, a, a strategy where you aggregate those data, literally all those differences disappear. And so that's a big problem, actually, for our science. So how do we actually, so that is a way to re-architect that a little bit more into a scientific structure of the people are different, context matters, and both change, right? So then how do we actually handle that, right? And, oh, sorry, and just, there's lots of examples. Weight, substance use, mental health, healthy routines, right? So pretty much the stuff we're talking about. Um, so what, now how are we classically working on this? I would call this the, we were calling this the big data paradigm, right? Our goal is first and foremost to produce, we call it generalizable knowledge, although I've been consciously calling it transportable knowledge building on Judea Pearls. Okay. Happy to talk about why later. But long story short is our fullest goal is generalizable knowledge or transportable knowledge, right? We're going to run our trial to see what happens on average, right? And then the logic is once we figure that out, we then try to disseminate it into clinics and communities. And then if they do it well, we actually end up helping individuals. Does that sound right as sort of a general theory of change on how we're doing our science? Now the problem is, as people are different, context matters in both changes, this and this are all very hard. And arguably we have an entire field of implementation science that formed recognizing that differences in people, place, and time matter, suggesting that this pathway might not actually be working. Now, it can work, right? Go into the paper. There are definitely times when this does work. And also, just to be transparent, it's fantastic that all of this work has happened in the past, right? It gives us a fantastic warm start so that we're not always starting from ground zero from any one individual, right? But the question that we're trying to think about is how do you get beyond that warm start, okay? And so this, this is a, sort of a, an alternative pathway you can think about, a small data paradigm, where the goal is... Uh, and this was very much came right out of conversations with Dana, where she's like prioritizing when we were working. It's like, our first goal should be to help people. And if we help people, then we can help the clinic. And then if we can help people, maybe then we can produce scientific knowledge. And as we thought about that more, it's like, huh, that actually is a really interesting alternative pathway towards transportable knowledge. Where your goal is for an N of one, how do you actually make sure you get success for that one person? You know, how do you help someone actually meet physical activity guidelines, a la uh, Daniel's work. How do you help someone increase their time and range with Dana's work, right? If you don't hit that marker, you're not succeeding yet. You don't go anywhere down. So going back to the earlier principle of resource efficiency, that's really resource efficient. You're not succeeding. Go back, figure it out, right? Now, did you produce transportable knowledge, generalized knowledge? No, of course not. But couldn't there be a pathway to figure that out, right? Where you start understanding and, and articulating the clusters. Like when you start getting success across many people, you can start to actually understand how those might manifest. In dynamical systems modeling, it's linear parameter varying models. It's basically like adding a moderator to the, 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 the models. You know, saying, oh, well, this is a model structure that might be useful again. Or if, you know, Shadish couldn't Campbell, it's a causal explanatory model. There's all different languages. so. But in case that one helped, right? Once you start seeing those, then you can actually use the work, arguably, of Judea Pearl and start to formalize your a hypothesis on how does this transport? How does this thing, is this idea, like this little loop, will it work somewhere else? And you can consciously test that by saying, here's a context where it should work and here's a context where it shouldn't work. And now it becomes an empirical question versus a hope and an aspiration that we have bound to a p-value, okay? <laughs> So that is a structure where you're building a logic for a transportable knowledge. And so that is uh, arguably our pathway from small data to uh, transportable knowledge. Okay. So just knowing that I'm getting, oh, I got like two good? minutes. Okay. Yeah. So we, we started five minutes late. So is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Perfect. I'm actually right on time. So great. So first, just to kind of give some definitions of this. For us, when we're thinking about big data, thinking about data used to help others, not the individual providing the data. Okay. 
So notice, I basically just clumped all of health sciences into big data, just to be transparent about that. Okay, um, what is small data? Data used to help the individual for whom the data are about. Okay, and notice I explicitly use the word individual. An individual doesn't have to be an individual person. It could be a city, it could be a region, it could be a healthcare clinic. Pick whatever unit you want to work from. Going back to Kronbach's idea of unit treatment observation setting, in case you know that, if you don't, don't worry about what I just said. N of one, it's an N, N of many focus, right? The, the idea is that you glean insights from a big, big data approach is by looking across individuals. And of course you can look at time but you're still, even when you're doing the within subject analyses, you're technically still doing looking at time across individuals. That's how it works, okay? Versus N of one is you are focusing across time for that individual. Your focus is on the future prediction and control for that individual, okay? Eric, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm just curious about the first point on the data. How does that fit within uh, the context of adaptive trial design that you don't go into I, I, let me get back to that. I answer that when I get to the answer. But in brief, I've been thinking about a priori optimization algorithms versus real-time optimization algorithms. Think like the difference between what you learn from MRT versus RL. And, and so how do you kind of build that structure between those two? But it, I ask that question again after I get to that in the slide. But I, it's an awesome question. Um, so next one. So the, this is researcher-led aligned to the on average work, right? Um, and so this is, you know, our goal is to build some sort of aggregation structure across individuals, right? Small data, this could be led by researchers, that's going to be what Daniel's going to be discussing, or it could be co-created, or it could be individual-led, a la Dana's work, right? The goal is to get to individual success for the person for whom the data is about, okay? And then finally, this is the last element to think about it. Big data, and, and this, I hope you hear it, these are totally complementary. Go back to the paper. We never said big data is bad. We're just saying, just like, because we're focusing on triangulation and building uh, different forces, small data is just a complement to it, right? So big data gives us a really good warm start. We don't always want to start from zero for every person, right? And if we only had small data, arguably that is exactly what we do. So from a resource efficiency, that would be very silly. But, or and, there's also something that happens is once you start having data from an individual, in a, you know, if you know Bayesian analysis, you can start updating your priors and you start changing your posteriors into your next priors, right? You start learning about that person and using that information to make better decisions for that individual, okay? So beyond the warm start, if you will. Okay, so how might uh, small data help? Uh, I'm actually going to run through this because I want to get to the concrete examples, right? But uh, so these are some ideas you can basically link. To, I basically point you to the paper. There's this. We go into a lot of detail in this one, right? But one of the ones that manifested idiosyncratically. I want to give this as a really concrete example. And so this comes right out of uh, my former uh, PhD student, Sally Fadak, and her dissertation. Long story short, we were doing work on N of one methods and processes to help people make decisions about, um, you know, positive psych things. So it's like meditation, random acts of kindness, and whatnot. And when we were in this trial, we were really noticing the sort of qualitative, quantitative things, like what's lost in, in translation when you only are using quantification. Uh, in your work, right? And in particular, this is the sort of stuff that people were telling us when we ran our N of 1 trial with them, basically saying, you know, like, you gave me this result, but here's all the broader context that that little, you know, your little statistical analysis didn't hit. You know, and then a key thing for them was your generalized outcome measure of stress wasn't my stress or whatever variation of well-being. And so we thought about that and we're like, I wonder if we could actually build personally relevant outcomes within this. And so here's the instructions we gave people. Please list two aspects of your well-being that you'd like to track during your experiments, uh, and your chosen outcomes can be something that is an observational action or psychological state or whatever you prefer, right? And then people gave us these things. So it's like, getting through my to-do list, that's really important for me. Or catching a train in the morning, that's really important for me. So notice what we just did here. We have a construct, well-being, and then just like how the strawberry is a, punish, is a reinforcer or a punishment for another kid, we built a way for someone to build a structure where they say, this is what that, how that manifests for me individually, manifested idiosyncratically, right? And then we just turn it into a simple question that they ask each day. 
And of course, does this get up everything? No, it's triangulation. But they really, you can go into her dissertation, we're working on the uh, paper right now, but they really like this. This was like, like that was far more useful and actionable information because that was the success criteria that I cared about, right? So a way to actually build from a construct to an individual idea, okay? Just to give you an idea. So now I'm just gonna tee up the, the next uh, two talks. So I'm gonna first quickly talk about Dana's, or da Daniel's, uh, work and our, I work with Daniel. So these are the, our key references to focus on. I also gave a Mind the Gap webinar if you want to kind of hear my take on, on what Daniel and I have been doing. But long story short is like, a key question, and this is very much teed up by Billy, is what can be optimized using the different uh, most methods that we're discussing, the different optimization trials, right? So one of them is an intervention package. You know, and that's particularly a key part for a factorial trial. You know, what is the components that you want to include or exclude under X amount of cost? Another one you can think about is, and I think this is still at a package level, by the way, is the sequence of treatment, right? This is where your SMART trial comes into play, right? Like, which decision do I do when I get non-responders? And Billy's definitely much more of an expert, so I'm sure she'll critique that formalism of SMART, but we can come back to that. For, jet, for MRTs, micro trials, one way you can think about it is you're trying to optimize the bout-specific decision rules, right? It's like, how do I actually know, is this a good time to intervene or not? Right? And then, and this is the, one, the fourth one that Daniel and I have been thinking about is, what if your problem is actually you want to try to move someone from one state to another state? So it's like someone's sedentary and you want them to become regularly active and maintain an outcome, right? Well, that's actually trying to optimize gradual, nonlinear, and idiosyncratic change. And for this, this is actually a really valuable approach, an N of 1 approach, an ideographic approach, uh, control systems engineering. And we've been calling it a control optimization trial. What do I mean by gradual idiosyncratic change, right? It's like someone starts here in terms of how many steps they have, and we want them to get up to there. How do we get someone from here to there knowing that people are different, context matters, and both change? Life happens, right? You get sick. How does your system actually handle that? How does it make follow-up decisions? That's what a controller does. Okay? And it's very much, I'm actually going to skip through this uh, idea. Oh, no, sorry, I'm not going to skip through this, this idea. The, the idea here it really is that a lot of this work, going to sort of the big data structure, Billy, now this is your, the question, right? A lot of the work that we've classically done, it's looking at data from prior individuals to then help inform the warm start for the next group of individuals. That's in terms of how you define the app, the if then algorithm, uh, or even defining what you ha might have in, a, in the reinforcement logic, right? But you can also build a real-time optimization algorithm, a la a controller, or reinforcement learning, which Ben brought up, right? Um, and what this is doing is it's using the data from the individual to see if they're actually doing well, right? So, so these are uh, approaches, and particularly that's, uh, like Daniel's gonna get into a lot more detail on the cut. okay? I'm gonna skip this, because Daniel's gonna get, get into that quite a bit. So now, just setting up Dana's talk, right? If, so one, so if, if the researcher's leading it, you can do these fancy methods, right? Another way you can do this is you can actually help an individual actually solve their own problems. And, Dana is an amazing example, but she's not the only example. I want to really emphasize this. There are a lot more really brilliant people who have this deep lived experience who are solving their own problems. And right now we're not honoring that wisdom. And so this one, and, and so this is sort of a, a, a rule from uh, an unwritten rule on the internet, right? It's like there's 1% of people who are often these big, creators of content, and then there's about 9% of people who are packaging and sharing it, and then 90% of people build this up, right? So just to be transparent, right now, the process that Dana and I have been talking about is how do we actually incorporate the 1% DIYers into the scientific process? And why, long story short, we think they have a valid perspective. And, it, and I, we have actually a blog on this uh, of uh, on like how this how, how to make an argument. So if you go to openingpathways.org, you can actually take a look at this. But long story short, this is a formalism on how do we get trustworthy scientific consensus from Boaz Miller. Um, long story short, three things that are orthogonal. The more we agree that we want to agree, social calibration. The more socially diverse we have, and the more we have consilience, there it is, uh, triangulation of evidence, he, uh, the more likely that any uh, conclusion that we're drawing, any consensus that's emerging, is trustworthy, right? Now, just to flip this, imagine that you basically don't check an assumption. Like, someone brings up a valid perspective, and the community never actually rules it out. Right? They have no structure. Thank you. I got that. That's totally cool. Uh, there's no way to rule out if they're right, right? Because they're not even part of the discourse. 
What that sets up is you'll get consensus, but not necessarily trustworthy scientific consensus because you never ruled out the alternative hypothesis, right? Like science works on basically the last thing standing is what we believe right now until we rule it out because we got the next better story, right? So social diversity is extremely important. And so people with the lived experience of a problem, don't you think that they probably have a, a, an important perspective that should be incorporated into our discourse? Now you might say, oh, we do this through qualitative work and whatnot. I'll let Dana continue on that one. But I, I wanna just end with a kind of discussion on, well, okay, if, if we're thinking patient-led and they're leading it, well then what's the role of the professionals? This is a point where I'm coming back to the importance of humility. And sort of, our, classically, we have an assumption that our job is to help and protect, right? You can think about this in terms of we run our randomized control trials to make sure that when the thing goes out, we're not going to kill you. Think FDA regulations. And that is cool, that is valuable, that is important. I'm not actually questioning that we should be safe and effective. What I am asking is, what might be some unintended consequences, particularly thinking about this from a psychological perspective? One, stereotyping. A person is a person, right? You see someone as a patient or a subject, right? <laughs> Think about those two words for a moment, right? You are, in a microaggression sort of way, undermining the humanity of a person when you use those phrases. You must be patiently waiting for me to solve your, the person must patiently wait for me to solve their problems, right? Think about that stereotype. That's weird. And it actually, and it, particularly if someone then internalizes that, <laughs> they might not feel like they can do something, right? A second layer, the omission bias, right? We, since our job is to help the masses and the public and the world, right, we might fall into a trap of maybe we can't do this, right? I, I was actually uh, had a conversation with someone who has worked on building the continuous glucose monitor, and I told them that I was working with Dana, and his response was, what you are doing is dangerous. You are going to kill someone. Stop right now. And I was like, huh. <laughs> That's interesting. It honestly shook me up quite a bit, and Dana and I had hours and hours of processing of, is he right? What's going on with this? And the long and the short of it is like, what I realized is he was making an assumption that people are stupid, and what we need to design for is the lowest common denominator. Like, he was basically thinking the only people that matter is the 90%, not the 1%. Now, for the 90%, he is exactly right. Like, if someone doesn't want to understand their type 1 diabetes and they, they just want a system to handle it, yes, makes good sense. We need to be, have a lot of safety checks, right? But for those people who want to engage in the science, shouldn't we have a pathway to help them? And then the last part to this is thinking about this from a learned helplessness perspective, right? What if, as you keep telling someone, no, just be patient, no, just be a subject and wait, wait for us to solve your problem for you, what are you training them to do? You're training them to basically fall into learned helplessness. And if you don't, I, I don't have time to really get into that. So, so the kind of summary statement on this one is, just remember this, you are working to help persons, and you are a person. Don't forget that. As simple as that might sound, it's really important. Okay, so here's my summary. Agile science, here's these key goals and principles, balancing practical, scientific, and documentation, resource efficiency, modularity, and systems and systems, using a process of iterative triangulation. Why we need a small data phenomenon uh, paradigm, basically because phenomenon are wicked complex and it complements big data. Um, what do we get when we do research-led work? We can actually start moving, building up these real-time optimization algorithms to actually help individuals. And then last but not least, what do we get from small data, uh, from uh, patient-led work? I think it actually increases the trustworthiness of our scientific consensus, and it also is a pathway where we can remember that humans deserve respect, inclusion, and support. A person, not the average. Thanks. These are the people I want to And yes, this was definitely a village, so I thank you all the and many people in this room, literally. So. I know I took up all my time, so I don't know if you want to have questions with me or if it, you know. Yes? So a lot of what you're saying about patient-led research sounds like community-based participatory research to me. Can you yep. talk about the distinction? Yeah, so think about the starting conditions of that. Oftentimes with community-based, so I've done community-based participatory research. Um, I think the long and the short of it is wait and hear Dana, but to, to build on that a little bit more, it comes down to how those starting conditions happen, right? It's like. <laughs> 
the, there's a community of, of uh, you know, honestly, I think I'm just going to punt. I just want you to hear Dana talk, and I think you'll start seeing the differences. It's, uh, but it's a really important question, and if it doesn't make sense, I'd be happy to have a longer conversation. I, I do think there's important things, to, and I also think there's a lot to be learned from CBPR. I'm a big fan of CBPR. This is not to negate that. It's to expand the breadth of what it means uh, uh, to do the work. Any other questions? Let's move to Dana. Yeah.